In this video, we're going to be talking about causal research as the last piece of the different types of research design that we have available to us. And if I'm allowed to have a favorite form of research, it's most definitely going to be this one. Causal research is what allows us to make causal claims, like a change in something caused an outcome to occur. And in marketing context, that might be like, I ran an advertisement and it increased sales, or I changed my price and it changed how sales played out. So the things we'll cover in this video are how to conduct this type of research, and we'll look at some examples of how this can be done well. But before we do that, we have to understand what's necessary to be able to make a causal claim of any kind. And there's three main components. The first is correlation. We need a relationship between variables to exist. If I change my price, well, sales have to change, or there can't possibly be a cause of some sort as a result of that change in price. Second, I need what's called time order. Now, this is the least interesting of the two, but basically the thing I do has to temporally precede the outcome of what occurs. Now, this is really useful in archival context, but when we're dealing with experimentation, it's almost always the case that we have an action that we take and then some outcome occurs afterwards. So we really don't think about this one too often. But the really big one is this idea of ruling out alternative explanations. And what's critical is we can't rule out some alternative explanations or even most alternative explanations. We have to rule out every single possible alternative explanation to a causal mechanism that we're proposing. And there's really only one way to do that, and that is with an experiment. But before we jump into that, I think it's worth spending a minute on correlation does not equal causation. This is something you've all heard before, and a pretty good quote that I like to reference for this one is that the invalid assumption that correlation implies cause is probably among the two or three most serious and common errors of human reasoning. The failure to understand that correlation doesn't equal causation is the root of myriad problems we have in interpreting data and interpreting statistics. So we should spend a minute or two thinking about this a bit more carefully. And the way I'm going to do that is with a few fun facts that are true. You can't dispute these facts. We can all look them up and find references for them. And then I'm going to put some inferences where maybe the inferences aren't quite so correct. So our first fact is that violent criminals watch more TV than non-criminals. This is 100% true. It is well documented. And the implication or the inference from that is that TV watching leads to or causes violent crime. And that inference maybe isn't correct. So think about why it might not be correct for just a moment. It's not the TV viewing caused violent crimes. It's that people who commit violent crimes just tend to watch more television. In other words, one is not causing the other. It could just be the opposite situation. And because it could be that, we cannot make that inference. We cannot make that causal claim. Another fact for you. Sleeping with shoes on is associated with waking up with a headache. Again, totally true. And the inference maybe one could draw from that is that sleeping with shoes causes headaches. But I hope you see that it doesn't have to be the case. In fact, we might have something that's called a third variable explanation here, which is that people who are intoxicated, who have had a lot to drink, perhaps forget to take their shoes off and also wake up with headaches. In other words, there's something else going on that explains this relationship much better than the causal mechanism proposed by that inference. And finally, the taller you are, the smarter you are. And I know that's a little unfortunate for those of you who are, are a little bit shorter watching this video, but the inference there is that height causes intelligence. But again, much like with the previous example, there's a third variable that much better explains this. Age causes intelligence. It turns out children are short and not very smart. And as they get older, they get taller and they get smarter. In other words, there's other things that better explain that relationship than a causal claim of height causing intelligence. The point of all this is that in all of these examples and in countless other ones, there are other things that better explain the causal relationship and we can't rule those things out, meaning we cannot make that causal claim. Now, there's this wonderful website that I'll provide a link to that looks at these correlations that exist that are super strong and they're, they're really funny. So for example, here's one that correlates the per capita cheese consumption with the number of people who died by becoming entangled in their bedsheets. That correlation is 0.94. That's insanely high. But I think we can all agree that those two are not causally connected. That's just what we call a spurious correlation. We see this everywhere. Just one more example for you. The correlation between the letters in winning words in the Scripps National Spelling Bee and the number of people killed by venomous spiders is 0.81. That's super high. Both of these are ridiculous. But if we think that just because things are associated, they're necessarily causally related, that's a mistaken judgment. The only way we can actually make a causal claim is with an experiment. And I'll show you what that is in just a moment. But first, let me give you an actual marketing context where we might want to actually look at this more carefully. So back in 2006, 
Subaru decided to offer a cash promotion as a way to attract customers. The promotions team at Subaru decided to put $2,000 in cash back on new cars as their main offer. And their goal was a 20% increase in sales due to this promotion. So what we might want to ask is if the promotion worked. Well, here are the data for January and February of that year. And you can see a substantial increase in sales. This is in New England. And that was actually a 33% increase in total sales. So did the promotion work? I hope you see that we don't know. This is an example of a correlation. Something changed, that would be the promotion. And something else changed, that would be the number of sales. But do we know that those two were causally linked? No, we don't. We can try and answer this question by looking at, let's say, the New York sales for this time period to see if that increase in sales happened there as well, where a promotion was not running. And that would be a pretty reasonable thing to do. And if we do that, we see that the sales increase was about 24% in New York during the same time period. But that still leaves us with about a 9 percentage point difference. So is that 9 percentage attributed to the promotion? Again, I hope you see that we just don't know. Anything else could have been going on. And in fact, exactly during this time period, there was a major snowstorm in the Northeast. And Subaru is a car brand that's associated with being a superior car in adverse weather. And it's no surprise that sales went up in response to a snowstorm. Now, is a snowstorm what caused it? I, I don't know. But it could have just as likely been the snowstorm as it was the promotion. And because of that, we can't answer this question. And now we finally get to experimentation. Experimentation requires a few components. First, we need multiple groups. The simplest version of an experiment would be an experimental group and a control group, meaning a group where nothing happens. Now, you could also have multiple experimental groups. You could also have no control group and just two experimental groups. That's fine. But as long as you have two or more groups to compare, you've got the beginnings of an experiment. But the most important thing and the critical piece of an experiment is that you have to randomly assign participants to actually be included in either of these groups. And the reason for that is this random assignment makes it so that anything that could be possibly different across two groups of, say, individuals or car dealerships or whatever your unit of measurement is, is equally represented across the groups that you have. So for example, if we go way back to that Verizon example with the promotion, if instead of just asking a bunch of people, what I did is I had a group of people who I made sure were exposed to a promotion and another group of people who I made sure were not exposed. And those two groups, I randomly assigned people to them and I'd like to see how many people I actually attracted to Verizon in that experimental group versus the treatment group and saw a difference. That's the only time where I can actually conclude that the promotion was effective. Because when I randomly assign people, I'm just as likely to assign someone who is wealthy or is poor or is a Verizon customer or a T-Mobile customer or anything else. That random assignment ensures that I have equal representation of every conceivable variable across my groups. And because of that, that third criteria for causality is satisfied, ruling out of all alternative explanations. Now, there are ways where this could go wrong, for instance, small sample sizes or bias in random assignment, that could mess this up. And for a detailed look at that, I'll actually provide some links to other content that you can look to to understand that a little bit more cleanly. But now let's look at an example of this actually done correctly. So imagine if I'm a researcher who wants to understand whether one of these two ads is more or less effective. So you see that the difference is pretty straightforward. In one case, you've got this woman on the left side. In another case, you have her on the right side. And it's a small difference, but I might want to know which one's more effective. I can't just give these ads out to people and hope to see what works. I have to run an experiment. And so a very simple experiment might look something like this. I randomly assign people to either receive the first ad, the second ad, or perhaps a control group where they don't receive an ad at all. And then I observe their sales data after the fact. So I could do this in a bunch of ways. Imagine putting this into a catalog where I can track who the individual is and see how much they buy as a function of which ad or whether they got an ad at all. Uh, or I could do this online with an online ad where I can see if there's a click-through change difference. So there's ways to measure this. And after I do this, assuming I have random assignment, I find something like this. Now, assuming those are statistically significant differences, which is a topic we'll cover in subsequent weeks, this is the point where we can ask, can we make the calls a claim that that second ad is more effective than the first ad? And this is the first time that we can say yes. Because we randomly assigned people to receive one of these ads or a control group, we can make the causal claim. Something varied, different ads, different sales, time order, we actually expose people to this ad first and then observe sales, and the random assignment deals with that third one of ruling out all alternative explanations. And just to wrap this up, the article that I asked you to read about Crayola crayons discusses a pretty sophisticated experiment where they manipulated the type of language they use in an email solicitation, and I have those on the screen here. And the thing that's worth noting is that by using this random assignment to these different versions of an email, they were actually able to find what the best and the worst response rate was. And the difference is striking. 
The response rate was a 33.7% for whatever happened to have been the best combination of options, compared to 9.7% for whatever was the worst set of options. That is a massive difference in how well people respond to these different emails. And the only way they can conclude this is through this experiment. So hopefully the next time they run an email campaign, what they're gonna do is use the best version. They don't have to run that experiment again. So causal research, experimentation in particular, is likely the best tool we have when we wanna make really important business decisions. If you wanna know if your product is gonna sell or not, an experiment is likely your best tool. It's also one of the most difficult tools to implement because you have to actually have the capacity and the mechanisms in place to run one of these experiments. Now, this being one of the most important topics in marketing research is definitely something we'll talk about in class, so please make sure to keep those questions handy.